Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Hmm. So a few evenings ago we spoke about um, simple living or natural living uh, and the benefits of that and how the present day lifestyle is destroying all the good qualities of a human being. Back to the land, back to Krishna's arrangement for human civilization. <clears throat> Um, so I thought I'd continue that with one aspect of that, and that is the where do the cows fit in, mm -hmm. and a little bit about the glories of cows. Mm -hmm. So this is one verse from the 14th chapter. Text number 16. Karmana Sute Yas Yahoo. Sat Vikam Nirmalam Falam Rajasa Tu Falam Dukam. Ajnanam tamasat phalam Karmana sukritas yahu Satvikam nirmalam phalam Rajasas tu phalam dukam Ajnanam tamasat phalam Translation, the result of pious action is pure and is said to be in the mode of goodness. But action done in the mode of passion results in misery and action performed in the mode of ignorance results in foolishness. So, results of pious activities in the mode of goodness is pure. Therefore, the sages who are free from all illusion are situated in happiness. But activities in the mode of passion are simply miserable. Any activity for material happiness is bound to be defeated. If, for example, one wants to have a skyscraper, so much human misery has to be undergone before a big scraper, skyscraper can be built. The financier has to take much trouble to earn a massive wealth, and those who are slaving to construct the building have to render physical toil. The miseries are there. Thus Bhagavad Gita says that any activity performed under the spell of the mode of passion, there is definitely great misery. There may be a little so-called mental happiness, I have this house or this money, but this is not actual happiness. As far as the mode of ignorance is concerned, the performer is without knowledge, and therefore all of his activities result in present misery, and afterwards he will go on towards animal life. Animal life is always misery, miserable, although under the spell of the illusionary energy, maya, the animal does not understand this. Slaughtering poor animals is also due to the mode of ignorance. The animal killers do not know that in the future the animal will have a body suitable to kill them. This is the law of nature. In human society, if one kills a man, he has to be hanged. That is the law of the state. Because of ignorance, people do not perceive that there is a complete state controlled by the Supreme Lord. Every living creature is the son of the Supreme Lord, and the Lord does not tolerate even an ant being killed. One has to pay for it. So indulgence in animal killing for the taste of the tongue is the grossest kind of ignorance. A human being has no need to kill animals because God has supplied so many nice things. If one indulges in meat-eating anyway, it is to be understood that he is acting in the mode of ignorance 
and is making his future very dark. Of all kinds of animal killing, the killing of cows is most vicious because the cow gives all kinds of pleasure by supplying milk. Cow slaughter is an act of the grossest type of ignorance. In the Vedic literature from the Rig Veda, the words Gobi Prinita Matsaram indicate that one who, being fully satisfied by milk, is desiring killing the cow, is in the grossest ignorance. There is also a prayer in the Vedic literature that states Namo Brahmanya Devaya, Go Brahmana Hitaya Cha Jagatitaya Krishnaya, Go Vindaya Namo Namaha. My Lord, you are the well-wisher of the cows and the brahmanas, and you are the well-wisher of the entire human society. From Vishnu Puran. The purpose is that special mention is given in that prayer to the protection of the cows and the brahmanas. Brahmanas are the symbol of spiritual education, and cows are the symbol of most valuable food. These two living creatures, the brahmanas and the cows, must be given all protection. That is real advancement in civilization. In modern human society, spiritual knowledge is neglected and cow killing is encouraged. It is to be understood that human society is advancing in the wrong direction and is clearing the path for its own condemnation. A civilization which guides the citizens to become animals in their next life is certainly not a human civilization. The present human civilization is, of course, grossly misled by the mode of passion and ignorance. It is a very dangerous age, and all nations should take care to provide the easiest process, Krishna consciousness, to save humanity from the greatest danger. Om Gyan Timirandasya Gyana Jana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Guruvena Maha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Stapti Tam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swam Padanti Kam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesa Sunyavadi Pastyatya De Satarine Shri Krishna, Chaitanya, Prabhu Nityananda, Shri Advaita Gadadara, Sivasari Gaur, Bhakta Vrinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. Hmm. Kila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Hmm. So, all life is sacred because all life is part of God. There are 8,400,000 species of life. And that means that in each and every one of these forms, there is a soul. And of course, each of the forms are numerous in their, in their own categories. So there are millions and billions of living entities. And they all are part of God. Amai Vamso Jiva Loke, Jivas Bhuta Sanatana. Masastastana Endriani Prakutistani Karshati. So the living entities are parts of the Lord and they live in this material world and they're struggling. So those who indulge in killing animals in order to satisfy their tongue, as this verse mentioned, are the lowest type of individuals. And as Prabhupada said, their future is very dark. <laughs> they don't know the laws of nature. And even if they're instructed, they cannot understand. They are so attached to their own selfish interests. Uh, animals are killed for two reasons. One, in order to taste the... Uh, uh, have a certain satisfaction of taste for eating flesh. And the second reason is for economic gain. They have made a business out of animal killing, particularly the cow. The cow is a very special animal. 
And we can, we're speaking it from the material point of view. The cow provides so many things. In fact, it's the backbone of agriculture. Without cows, agriculture doesn't develop properly because cows fertilize the soil nicely and produce uh, various types of nutrients, both in the soil and give the soil life simply by their grazing. Their saliva, their dung, their urine, everything is pure. Um, it even says that cow dung, if you have some kind of cut, you can put cow dung on the cut and gradually it will heal. Cow dung is used to purify homes. You always smear cow dung on the walls. It cleans the house, purifies the house, and gives it a nice ambience. Um, cow urine, it's even proved that, you know, people who have cancer, distilled cow urine is one remedy to decrease cancer cells. And it's also full of many nutrients. Uh, the cow provides milk, which provides many nice foodstuffs from milk. We get ghee for cooking, which is so, what we say, tasty and so healthy. We also have yogurt and cheese, varieties of cheese, yogurt, and uh, various other types of milk preparations. In fact, there, there are over 200 different Milks, milk preparations that one can make simply from milk al alone, just milk and sugar. So milk is, uh, is like the miracle food. And as it says in the Shastras, that milk, especially hot milk, when taken in the evening, uh, gives what we say nutrients to finer brain tissues. And it says finer brain tissues are necessary for understanding spiritual topics. Mm -hmm. So everything about the cow is auspicious. Cow dung can be dried and used for cooking, and it also can be used for heating, a processing plant for taking cow urine, a cow dung, and processing and making goba fuel, and using it to heat houses. Uh, There's a whole long list. When I was in, uh, when I was in uh, one place in South India, I think it was Belgaum, the devotees had put on a little demonstration of more than 40 different products that they had gotten from cow, cow soap, cow shampoo, cow and skin freshener, so many things. But I saw something really interesting it really it was astonishing. They had two pots of cow urine and cow dung together, and they had a clock above it. The clock had two wires coming from the clock. One wire was put into one pot, and the other wire was put into the other pot. And simply by putting these wires in the pot, the, cow, the clock was working. <laughs> So, you know, it even replaces electricity in some of its, in some ways. So everything about a cow is wonderful. In fact, it says all the demigods reside in the body of the cow. And Lakshmi Devi herself is actually uh, cow dung. It's mentioned that she resides within the cow dung itself. So there are so many benefits for cows, but we live in a civilization that is uh, completely ignorant of the values of cows and are simply destroying the cows and therefore creating tremendous amount of bad karma, which is permeating everywhere in the world. It's interesting to note that all the latest epidemics, such as AIDS, Ebola, SARS, um, of course, coronavirus, which is happening now, 
Uh, I forgot the other one. Swine flu, uh, bird flu. All these particular epidemics have been caused by humans in contact with animals for either killing them or eating them. So this is not some kind of karmic expression. This is actually a scientific fact. This is actually known. So therefore, you know, we are pretty much destroying the human race as we destroy the animals because the animals are part of God's arrangement for man to live happily and nicely. And therefore to kill, it goes against the laws of God and it goes against the laws of uh, morality and religion. In the Vedic Shastras, it says, killing a cow is equal to killing two men. <laughs> That's how important cows are. Uh, if you, right now, even in, even in some places in the West, they have this thing called cow therapy, where people who suffer from various kinds of mental illness or some kind of depression, they recommend them to stay and be with cows. And uh, they actually arrange that, and people who stay with cows for a while, they find their anxiety is gone, their depression is gone, their mental illness is reduced, the effects of it is reduced. Cows are auspicious in, in so many ways. They are a very integral part of God's arrangement for living pe peaceful and happy on this planet. And therefore, cow protection, and not only protection, but cow care, cow care is a little higher than cow protection because it means to give the cow whatever she needs or he needs. Sometimes we make a mistake and we think there's only one kind of cow, but there's two kinds. <laughs> one is a female and one is a male, and that's a bull. The bulls don't have a chance because now nobody uses bullocks. Only a few people around the world. Bullocks are becoming replaced by tractors and various kinds of mechanized uh, you know, ways of farming. So the bull is standing idle, and therefore the bull is no longer used. So the bulls get killed right as soon as they're born, practically. The female cows are grown up. They just get as much milk as they can. And when she can no longer give milk, they uh, take her to the slaughterhouse. So this is the most cruel and vicious civilization. And the reactions are coming in the form of various types of diseases. And it's also been said by many philanthropists and others that animal slaughter is directly related to wars mm -hmm. because it produces so much amounts of vicious types of karmic reactions which causes it to burst in the form of nat national and international calamities. So we're practically destroying ourselves by destroying the animals that God has given us and therefore but here Prabhupada says you know you can live happily easily and nicely without killing animals we know that for sure by our own example in, in the Krishna conscious society there's so many nice foods and in fact for those who are meat eaters as soon as they give up meat eating they get a little confused what to eat but when they start understanding that there's a whole world of nice vegetarian cuisine available that is both nutritious and tasty, then they will understand, uh, you know, what it means to eat nicely. Also, the killing of cows is also directly related to the pollution in the, in the environment. As they uh, they uh, they arrange large amounts of area for cows to get fed with grains, so they get fat, and then um, they deprive human beings of this farmland, so they can 
feed thousands and thousands of cows and they fatten them up. And of course, I don't know all the details, but I have read many statistics related to, you know, scarcity of various minerals, nutrition, and even water supplies and pollution of the of the air that is directly related to the killing of cows. There was one movie that came out a few years ago called Cowspiracy, which meant this, you know, there's a word conspiracy, but this person who did it was a environmentalist and he was running to various environmental groups trying to find out, get some support to find out what we can do to save the environment. And during his research, he started to study a little bit about cows and how cows are related to the environment. His study revealed that actually most of the pollution in the world is related to the slaughter of animals. When he tried to present these to the various ecological groups, everybody closed their doors. They didn't want to hear it except one group was a little bit open. When the uh, when this movie started to get circulation, it came to the attention of some people who have big interests in meat industries. So the meat industries made it, made it possible for that movie not to be circulated anymore. So now, of course, the movie was gonna go everywhere but now they shut that down. So only those who have the movie, I've seen it. It's quite, quite horrific. What happens to the entire world due to the, to the killing of cows? And we can actually rightly say, you know, because of that, we have so many diseases rampant. And so here, cows are very dear to the Supreme Lord. And uh, Krishna is called Gopal. <laughs> Go means cow, Paul means protector. He's protector of the cows. Another name for Krishna is Govinda, one who gives pleasure to the cows, the lands, and the senses. Krishna's planet is called Goloka, the planet of the cows. <laughs> Obviously, this is not something accidental. Why is the cows given so much importance, even in the higher realms of spirituality? Cow is a very beautiful animal. When it's mistreated, it acts differently. Just like when you're mistreated, you will act differently too. <laughs> That's just... But a cow, when it's treated properly, it is very loving and kind. And it's very fits very nicely into human civilization. To keep cows, to protect cows, to care for cows, to use cows, is actually the backbone of civilization. Therefore, we see Nanda Maharaj Krishna's father had 900,000 cows. <laughs> and cows were a very big part of the Vedic culture, both spiritually and materially. From the spiritual point of view, cow dung, cow urine, and this thing called pancha gavya. Pancha means five, gavya means cow five substances that come from the cow that are used to bathe the deity. We bathe the deity with cow dung, cow urine, uh, ghee, uh, what else? Ghee, cow dung, cow urine, ghee, um, milk, and yogurt. Yeah, these are called panchagavya when we do uh, abhishek. Sometimes we do it with these five substances. So the, the body of the deity is, is given cow dung and cow urine. So we can understand how pure, and of course even science could say that, even, that in cow dung there is all nutrients and very purifying agencies that even people who are, what we say, expert with medicine have extracted various nutrients from cow dung and used it to create various types of medicines. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, uh, and so there are many, many benefits. And of course, 
for agriculture, the bull and the cow remain uh, foremost to provide the proper agriculture for the living entity. So what Krishna has given us as far as um, how to live is being replaced by this uh, way of life that is just squeezing all of the natural uh, energies out of everyone. And people are, the amount of depression in the world, I'm sure it's an even risen now since this coronavirus, is phenomenal. In fact, they say by the year, well, it's happened. They said by the year 2020, uh, you know, one third of the world will be suffering from various types of mental diseases. That's, there's over 7 billion people in the world, so you can imagine one third of that. That means there's more than 2 billion people suffering from various types of mental diseases. More than 2 billion. So, yeah, we've created a, a way of life that really goes against the whole social, uh, humanitarian, aesthetic, moral, and spiritual values of life. And uh, it's simply gained, engaged simply for money and as much sense gratification as we can. Sometimes we say, well, people say, well, if I want to eat meat, then you can't, you know, I have my choice. Well, you're eating meat and allows for cows to be killed, and that affects all of us. So those who are eating meat are actually causing jeopardy and harm to the entire civilization, and not just themselves. But Prabhupada was very merciful. He says, if you really want to eat meat and you cannot give it up, wait till the cow dies naturally, and then take that and then you can use the cow's body in different ways. Of course, devotees um, don't do that, but people who are, what we say, avid meat eaters can uh, avoid the sinful reactions of killing and still have their meat if they just be patient and let cows live out their life. It's the killing that causes the tremendous karma. Every animal or every living entity has been given a right to life by God. And no one can interfere with that right to life. If you interfere with the right to life of another living entity, you transgress the laws of material energy and you must suffer for that. So that is human civilization. But we live in a civilization where humanity has been sublimated to economic development and, and sense gratification. We live in a pretty vicious society like that. So, um, uh, it says in the Shastras also, five types of people, uh, old people, children, women, brahmanas, and cows must be given protection by the heads of state, by society. Otherwise, if they are denied that, there is great sinful reactions upon the whole society. And it says that of those five, the Brahmins and the cows are the most important. The Brahmins give spiritual guidance, knowledge, and the cows give economic basis to life. But then again, another injunction is mentioned that out of the two, the cows are the most important, even given preference over the brahmanas. So how valuable cows are? Um, there's so much. Uh, only when you live around cows and you stay with cows can you understand how wonderful cows are and how, what we say, how much they provide both spiritually and materially to the human civilization. So it's recommended that those of us who live in the cities, who are not around cows, go to the farms, go see the cows, take some time, 
for the first 20-some years of my Krishna consciousness, I lived in the New Vrindavan farm community, and we had many cows. And uh, we had a little cow barn right near the temple. And at the end of the morning program, right after the Bhagavatam class every day, before breakfast, all the devotees would go out and see the cows. <laughs> we would bring some food for the cows. We would uh, pet the cows. We would comb their bodies and just spend time. And it was very therapeutic. And the cows, of course, loved it also. So um, we see how valuable. And of course, real cow's milk, not the milk that is taken from slaughtered cows. Milk taken from slaughtered cows or cows that are going to be slaughtered is not the same of milk that comes from protected cows because the cows, they know, they sense that they're, they're in danger and therefore their milk is different. It produces a type of, of what we say uh, enzyme that is not healthy for the human body. So there is, you know, so the cows are very, what we say, conscious of the fact that when they're protected, they're very happy. And when they're not protected, they are very unhappy. And of course, when they're unhappy, their milk is not the same as when they're happy. Because <laughs> the mil their milk is their love for their calves like that. So, um, cows are very important and a very integral part of human society, human happiness, human progress, and spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I'll stop here. Any questions, comments? Go Mata. Yes, Mark and Dea. Gabriel? Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you for our lecture, Your Holiness. Uh, is cow actually the highest form of animal life and the most precious one? Yeah. Is it accepted a, by the yeah, Vedas? Yes, the highest form of animal life. Yeah, and the most precious. On the evolutionary scale, that when when the soul travels through different forms of life, before it reaches the human life, it it uh, takes the body of a monkey, tiger, or cow. And those who take birth in the mode of ignorance in the human form of life are coming from the monkeys. Those who take birth in the human form of life in their first human birth are coming from the tigers in the mode of passion. And those who take birth in the mode of goodness in the human form of life are coming from cows. And that's a direct statement from Srimad Bhagavatam. Yes, yeah, so the cows are very high in the evolutionary scale as far as the animals are concerned. They are the highest. Mm -hmm. Hare Krishna, thank you. Uh, is it true? Closer. Is it true that uh, cows can give milk even though they don't have a calf if they're properly taken care of? Well, generally, cows give milk even above what the calf is needed, yeah. If they're properly taken care of, they will give milk even after the calf is no longer needing the milk, but not through their whole life. Mm -hmm. 
for a few years after that. We've seen that in certain farms in our Krishna consciousness. Yeah, if uh, cows respond to affection, if you're if you're affectionate to the cows, they are very responsive to your affection. When you start spending time with cows, you'll understand how lovely they are. <laughs> we would go out sometimes and feed the cows. We'd give them porries and bananas <laughs> like that various types of food. And so in our Mayapur, there's one devotee there. He set up a little Goshala uh, on his own, and he has about 30 cows. His name is Dial Mukund. And he's uh, very compassionate towards animals. He rescues stray cows and brings them to his place and takes care of them. Cows, bulls, and dogs. He has a place for dogs, too. <laughs> uh, and uh, I spend time with that, and I go there and spend time with the cows, feed the cows, and just... The cows are all around, so it's like we're right in the middle of the cows. And cow, Each cow has his own personality, her own personality. When I was in New Vrindavan, in the very beginning, um, we had gotten four cows. We sent a letter to Srila Prabhupada and said, Srila Prabhupada, we have four cows. Could you give us names for the four cows? So Prabhupada wrote back, Sarabi. <laughs> so then we wrote back and said, Prabhupada, we need four names. You only gave us one. He said, he wrote back, Sarabi 1, Sarabi 2, Sarabi 3, Sarabi 4. <laughs> Prabhupada saw the cows that are taken care of by devotees as wish-fulfilling cows. <laughs> like that. We had some amazing cows. We had some cows that would give naturally without any forced milkings like more than a hundred pounds of milk per day. Yeah, there was one cow called Kalia. She was a beautiful cow. Prabhupada got her milk and said that her milk is the best that he's ever had. He said we should make everything from her milk. We were making all the milk sweets for the deities from this one cow called Kalia. Kalia was so personal, and she and he had a she had a very special relationship with Prabhupada. When Prabhupada came the second time, uh, Kalia was Prabhupada was coming to the Brahmachari farm, and he was walking up the trail. Kaliya was at the farm. When Kaliya realized Prabhupada was coming, she ran fast and went right towards Prabhupada. She came all the way up to Prabhupada, stopped, turned around, and led Prabhupada to the ashram. <laughs> it was amazing. Prabhupada had a special relationship with Kaliya. She was a black and white Jersey cow. <laughs> And her milk was just like pure cream, practically. In fact, devotees had so much nice milk in New Vrindavan that we wound up drinking too much milk. <laughs> but we always had nice milk sweets. When we would go to India, we would go to see Prabhupada in India. He would always ask us, where's the, where's the milk sweets from, the, from your cows? We would bring Sandesh and Burfi and Koa and Para, and various types of milk sweets. New Vrindavan was a was a what do I say an arsenal of various types of milk sweets. People would come just to New Vrindavan just to just to taste the milk sweets. It was so nice.
So yeah, cows are, we can't speak enough about the glories of the cows. And, but it's so sad what's happening in the world. We hope that this uh, coronavirus will, be, will wake up people to stop eating me meat, any kind of meat, because it's causing great, uh, you know, hardships on the on the earth and on life itself. Mm -hmm. And it's guaranteed if people continue with their, uh, you know, meat eating in the same way we're going now, then what will happen is that there will be another virus, maybe even more vicious than this one. <laughs> It's inevitable because in the Vedic literature, there's this thing called Mamsa, M-A-M-S-A. Mamsa is a concessionary program for people who want to eat meat. They say, if you want to eat meat, then you should do it according to the Vedic statement. Mamsa is the statement. And Mamsa means, Mam means me and Sa means he. I am killing you, and you will kill me. That's what it means. <laughs> so it says that you go on the dark moon night, and you take a goat, and you kill a goat, and you chant this mantra. And my dear Mr. Goat, I am killing you to eat your flesh, but in the future life, you will come back and kill me and eat me. That's the mantra. When people realize what the mantra is, it's meant to discourage people from eating meat. So for those who are so determined that they will do anything, there is a certain principle that they can follow, which causes them, of course, to suffer later anyway. But nowadays people follow no rules and regulations. They open all the whole slaughterhouses and wherever there's slaughterhouses, there's tremendous amounts of suffering for both the cows, of course, and, of course, for the people who run these slaughterhouses. So, uh, as Krishna conscious devotees, we have to speak out against this, this travesty of destroying life in the name of satisfying the lusty demands of the tongue. Mm -hmm. And we can prove that if you, by, by eating a nice sattvic diet, food in the mode of goodness, you can increase your health and also you can reduce, you know, your mental and physical problems. Mm -hmm. But to speak, if you become Krishna conscious, then you're then you reduce all problems. <laughs> because eating is a big part of life, and therefore we don't we eat only food that's offered to the Lord, and the Lord will not accept any food that are only in the modes of goodness. He doesn't food, accept foods in the matter mode of passion or foods in the mode of ignorance. And foods in a mode of goodness are grains, milk products, fruits, vegetables, legumes, like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions, comments? Krishna. Uh, this is a comment by Moha Nasini Radha Dasi. Uh, and a question. We go visit the cows regularly, feed them, cuddle with them, and spend some time. But what about taking the milk from them if it is not ahimsa when we don't have uh, another option so far? Hmm. Well, the GBC has made it a resolution that every temple by the year 2022 must provide a himsa milk for all the offerings. Every temple around 
So therefore, there are we have a, a lot of farm communities, and therefore proper care of cows and distribution of milk to the other temples is actually a policy that must be adopted. Otherwise, the devotees will be inclined to take milk from other places which are not as healthy or and also at the same time based on the principle of slaughtering the animal. So, um, in, in right consciousness, it's better to refrain from taking any of those milk products and try to get him some milk. If you try, you can do it because there are many farms that do have a hymns and milk. And there's many, cap, there's many individual devotees who have farms who produce their own milk just for their local devotees in the area or just for their own needs like that. So I think it takes a little research to come up with that. Croatia has many devotees who have farms with some cows. So, but they need they need development though. Our farms are there, but they're not developed enough where a system of milk production can be given where it can benefit, you know, the entire area of devotees like that. So my my says my feeling is I wouldn't take any milk unless it's a Hemson milk. And I would rather not have milk than have milk coming from other places. That's my determination. Any other questions? Um, what should be our view on these different animal protection or, or environmental protection groups? Should devotees support these and participate? Or? Not really. They just waste time, take taxpayers' money, they don't do anything, really. If they're doing so much, why is there so many problems in the world yet with environment? There's so many groups, but they're paid by government agencies not to do anything. They're, they're, these groups are just do a little piecemeal. They do a little something here, they do a little something there. They never really tackle the problem of the real. The real problem is animal slaughter. That's where pollution starts and develops. Work, on, work in those areas or work with devotees to work on ecological things. People are people are trying to, you know, to do something to help the environment. What are they doing? They take shorter showers to save a little water, they recycle some paper. But that doesn't do anything. At the same time mass trees are being destroyed in order to have nonsense literature. And Tons and tons of water is being used simply to fertilize fields for cows so they can grow them, grow, you know, grains so the cows can eat and get fat fast so they can send them to the slaughterhouse. There's many books that describe all this, you know. So if you really want to do something for the environment and practice Krishna consciousness and speak out against all of these uh, bogus attempts because there's they don't really do so much it's like trying to put a band-aid on a cancer victim <laughs> we should live according to what we believe in order to show example to the rest of the world and gradually develop that. 
And that's why we have our farms. We have our Mayapur. We have farms in the UK. We have farms in the US. We have farms in, in different places in Europe. We have farms in Africa. We do have farms that are developing and do cow protection, but they still need a lot more, uh, what we say, manpower and support in order for it to actually, what we say, develop in such a way that it can, you know, sustain the entire society. We talked about that too, agriculture, food grown by our own farms are much more nutritious and also more in the mode of goodness than food that we buy in the stores. We have our new Raja Dam. They have many cows and they also grow at least 30 or more different types of vegetables and, and they have at least 20 some different kinds of fruit trees there. This is Prabhupada's plan for our society. Yes. This is question by Shri Devi Dasi. <clears throat> if I kill an animal for eating in next life, how will I be killed by that animal in my next life? Mm -hmm. Will it be human and I will be the animal I killed? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Mamsa. Don't worry, the material nature knows how to take care of everything. Don't worry. You'll get it. <laughs> exactly how it happens, you may not understand. Daiva, karma Daiva Natrena is mentioned in the Shastras. That everything happens under the laws of material energy. And the material energy works under the laws of God. Material energy carries out the will of God in different ways. To punish and to reward the living entities accordingly. But if you know, if you take the Krishna consciousness and you chant Hare Krishna, you reduce the effects of your karmic reactions and ultimately and they will be completely uh, destroyed in due course of time. Many of us before we came to Krishna conscious committed so many sinful activities. But now once we take the Krishna consciousness, then we become free from the reactions of the sinful activities. That's the power of bhakti. But that doesn't mean because you've become free that you can again go back and do the same thing again. Then the principle doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So just take the Krishna conscious and then you will not cause anyone any unnecessary harm. The devotee by nature doesn't cause anyone any harm, either mentally or physically. Anything else? Okay, we can stop here. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Go mata ki jai. Exactly one hour.